Thanks, John, for inviting me to your, this is your, this your house, yeah. apartment, penthouse, <laughs> whatever. And uh, I, I really want, we did a great interview and it had a huge amount of, um, I guess, how do, how do I describe that? Had a I, I'm looking forward to you describing it. <laughs> Positive, I didn't even look. I don't look at the comments. Stuff, but then yeah. there was also some crazy yeah. sort of bodybuilder types that really yeah. kind of decided to stick the boot in and, and not believe it. There's and, a lot of losers out there. Yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't even, the best part was they didn't even listen to the podcast because the questions they were asking and complaining that I never answer, I answer in every podcast. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that. So I wanted to, I'm a, I am a person that spent many years lifting weights yeah uh, but i'm also a person that gets that travels a lot that stays in hotels and wants a quick workout and and um i wanted to really just feel for myself get you know just because i've got a sense of does that work or doesn't it so i wanted mm -hmm. you to be able to sort of take me for a real workout so i could just sort of get get my own personal perspective yeah. on what it is and do i feel as though i've had a great workout or not so but before we start i thought maybe you could just talk me through the product and explain exactly what it is and um and what okay. you're working on at the moment. So here's the product. This is everything that it comes with. And I, I recently started explaining it a little differently because I used to go down the entire path of variable resistance. And you lose people right away when you, when you start with science, especially if they're not sure if they want to listen because they're not sure if they want to maybe want to believe what you're saying or want to learn anything. It takes a lot for people to want to learn. They got to commit some time. They got to commit some thought to it. So. I explain it a little differently. This is a way to train heavier than you ever could in a gym environment. So you're going to put heavier loads on the body. You're also going to train with more repetitions because of the variable resistance. And so everybody knows the heavier load you put through a muscle and the greater fatigue you get, the more growth you're going to have. No one's going to argue with that. So that's the objective of the product. Now, the right. way we do it is with variable resistance. Uh, originally, I was thinking about writing a book about just bands. And the reason I decided against that was because, like, let's say I take a heavy band here and I, you know, I go to put my hand through it. Let's say I'm going to throw it around my back and do a push-up. Well, the problem is as I go to do a push-up, this happens to my hands. My hands start twisting outward, which is why nobody really gets anything out of bands. This is where the myth comes from that bands don't do anything. And it's not really a myth because bands by themselves will twist smaller joints. Mm -hmm. So then the engineering objective was, okay, what's well, going to protect smaller joints? Well, probably one of those genius inventions ever is the barbell. <laughs> because the barbell rolls, like it's got bearings, so it keeps your wrist neutral and it, and it protects your wrist. You can put heavy loads through the body. So, you know, I, here's a smarter barbell that's for variable resistance. So we hook the banding on here and now like I can do this and my wrist is never compromised. So now I can train with incredible forces by having this hooked up the way it is and never compromise my joints. Mm -hmm. Also, like, like let's say I'm doing a chest press. People complain it's hard to get in the chest press position. If you just watched, no, it's not. Uh, so here I'm going to do a chest press. So very light load, you know, this is maybe 50 to maybe hundred pounds here. It may be 200 pounds here. It may be 180, 190 pounds here. Um, so I am able to, in a slow and controlled manner, go to exhaustion. Now this isn't the band I would use. This is a little bit lighter. So I'm able to deliver more weight through the musculature, fatigue more tissue than I ever could otherwise. But where's the risk? Because if it, if it starts to feel, if I start not able to, you know, being able to get there, then I shorten the repetition. All right. And what about so, the position, right? That's quite a narrow grip. Is that, does that not matter whether you're wide or narrow? Or? Great question. Um, a wide grip is great if you're in a bench press contest. Right. Or if you're trying to look cool on an Instagram video. Right, so a, bit, a wide grip is all—it's it's a way that the power lifters are sort of allowed to cheat uh, because they have less distance to go. The wider the grip, the less they have to move the bar. So, if you want to grow, which is the intention of this this product, you want the maximum contraction possible. 
So if we want the con pecs contracted, do we want to be right here or do we want to be out here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, if we want this shorter, it's got to be in here. Course, yeah. Right, so a close grip is actually much more for the pectorals than anything else, especially with the variable resistance. A lot of people don't intuitively know that. Also, a lot of people train wide grip, so they're always sort of cheating themselves, imagining that they're stronger than they really are. But that's training for show. That's not training for growth. Right. So uh, it's unfortunate that people are confused on that subject. And on that, is it like, yeah. I mean, you've done a lot of research on these things. Is there anything, like, I guess it makes sense, like if I wanted to really sort of squeeze my pec, bringing my arm in compared yeah. to there, does it? But is that, is, is that a, a sort of a fact that you can't argue with, that that, that movement is gonna... The, the shorter the pectoral is, the more engaged it is. So even like crossovers, we do we do, do uh, some, some like crossovers with the band. There are a number of professional athletes that they don't like bench press for whatever reason, but they do crossovers. Because like getting here is certainly a greater contraction than just getting right here. But that's not very functional. It's not gonna train you to do anything better athletically. That's more aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So I wanna say athletes, I know if you're bodybuilders that only do, and they only focus on crossovers. So uh, I have people do both. I would say the crossover is optional, but if you have trouble firing your pectorals, you kind of superset them, just do the chest press first. And then, and then the crossover. But all, all the things, like the whole product, the concept, everything, um, it's really simple and elegant, and it really doesn't have to be more complicated than this. I don't do anything other than this. Right. Um, and I put, on, I put on 45 pounds of muscle in the first two years, which I think is beyond what most people's ultimate fitness goal is. Uh, what and was your starting point? Because I know that was one of the So I was, a, I was like a fat uh, 190. Right. And I was 190, 20% body fat. And like, I actually just posted my like day one picture compared to like two years later. And uh, yeah, I was, I looked phenomenal two years later. Now, also I have a natural level of testosterone for people out there that don't understand what the word replacement means. You should Google it, the word replacement. So uh, testosterone replacement therapy means replacing what's supposed to be there. So I'm a patient of that. But I, I had that for 12 years and it did nothing. Mm. And then I started X3 and that, then I put on all that. Right. So I, that didn't do anything. So you got the bar, set some bands, and then this, what's this, what's the plate? So oh. the plate is the equivalent of the bar to keep the ankles from being twisted. So like if I did a deadlift and ran this heavy band under my feet, my feet would go in like this. And with the plate, they can stay neutral. So, I mean, like, here, I'll, I'll do it with this band. But when I have the plate here, so I can do, I can do a deadlift without impacting my ankles. So it's just like lifting off the floor. Right. But, but not. Yeah. Yeah, so the band can flex under there. Okay. Move. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, so let's do a workout then, do we? So I'm gonna put my my zone on, just to see what my heart yeah. rate is, because I know a few people sort of said, like, how tough is the workout? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if it gets me blowing or not. There you go. Okay. I'll show you what that's like later. So what do you normally do in terms of warm up then? Generally. You know, the first, so you, you try and go minimum 15 repetitions, 15 to 40. So we go higher repetitions just for safety reasons. Like you're dealing with way more weight at the top than you'd normally be dealing with. And there's an app that you can get where you enter your height and it'll tell you exactly what you're lifting with which band uh, from strong to weak range. But try this one for the deadlift. Okay. Good. Try not to let it relax at the bottom. Keep constant tension. Good. Yeah, I don't want to hear any more noise out of that. Good. Good. 
Okay, what That's you would have wanted to do is instead of just stopping, you, you, you'd shorten up the range so then you'd only go to here. Oh, okay. And you'd do partial repetitions and right. so you just cannot move. Okay. So you're just stuck in the down position. Yep. So shorten up the range. <laughs> okay. Well, you're spent. So. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the best deadlift session in your life. It's just, uh, it's over pretty quick and you don't do more than one set. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's different to how I thought it was going to be, to be honest. Uh, well, it, it feel, it's a lot more exhausting than weightlifting is. Right. Like you're, you're, ga you're gasping for air right now. I know you're trying to hide it very well. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's a different level of exhaustion because you're able to engage so much more tissue. Yeah. With so much more weight. Right. That's why. Yeah. So single arm movements are not really what the body responds to. Okay. And this, there's some research on this. And, and basically what's going on is like if your body had to move something heavy, you wouldn't try and move two heavy things, one with each hand. Right. That doesn't make sense. You use both hands, pick it up. But then when it comes to your lower body, unless you're a kangaroo, you walk on one leg at a time or run on one yeah. leg at a time. Yeah. So training single limb makes sense with lower body. Yeah. It does not make sense with upper body. When you look at the electron myography of somebody with a barbell and somebody with two dumbbells, 20% less muscle is being used when you're using a dumbbell for anything. Really? Yeah, I would never use a dumbbell, never. And what, what about like you, a lot of the stuff you talk about from a sports perspective, like if you're, I don't know, if you're sort of like pulling someone. Yeah, obviously, so, but, but a lot of that is drills. A lot okay. of that is like specifics for a sport. I'm obviously not against that yeah. because like if you're training to be good for a sport, you gotta be good at your sport. Yeah. Now what you're, what you're not saying is look, this is how you would train if you're a NBA, NFL, well, NBA would, and NFL uses, but they still have to do all their basketball drills. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the part. Yeah, nobody says doing a deadlift will make you shoot a basketball. <laughs> and, I mean, you yeah. might be better at it because you're able to engage more muscle, but you still got to do your shooting drills. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. What they're uh, I, I've seen that also where people are like, "You think this is the answer to everything?" No, but it's the answer to the question you have. Right. Because most people just want to be big and strong. Yeah. Yeah, like 99.9% okay. .9 of the people are just asking, you know, and, and I guess they want to play gotcha with like, oh, what happens if the badminton world champion wants to employ X3? Well, there's probably some badminton drills that I'm not aware of, because hmm. why would I be? Yeah. So, yeah, you use so X3 in terms for your of strength. strength yeah. You would, you like what you're saying is that, double, you know, like two hands is better than one in terms of specifically to develop strength within a muscle. The point of the product is to grow as much muscle as possible, as fast as possible. If that's your goal. Right. Yeah. Also, there's people who, you know, gymnasts who have to stay in, in their weight class. Right. So put on some mass, but you got to, you got to stay in a certain range. Yeah. You might want to put on some mass where you don't have it, like let's say in glutes or hamstrings. Gymnasts never seem to have those powerful enough, even though they're like the most powerful people in that category. And they may want to do a little bit less of something else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you don't. Or, or what they'll do is they'll really focus on, and this is not part of the recommended program, they'll really focus on explosiveness so they can time activation of tissue, but that's for a professional strength coach mm. to decide. I, I don't want anybody at home deciding, oh, I'm going to train for explosiveness today. That's, that's how ambulances come. Mm. Do you do yeah. any explosive moves with this no. or is it you don't? Everything is so and... uncontrolled. Nobody is supposed to deviate from the program. Even the NFL and NBA guys, I tell them if you want to do explosive training, you do that with your strength coaches. Yeah, right. You don't do that with X3. Your X3 is just for strength. But there's there's some other conditioning that you're going to do. You got to be fast, you know, right when the ball snaps, yeah. right? So that they have drills for that. Right. So they're not they're they're able to grow more muscle. Then they can train the muscle to fire in a certain way. But see, that's a skill. That's like throwing a baseball or swinging a golf club. Yeah. Like that's that's not what this does. And what about the skill development? Like, say for a deadlift or even a squat. I know, I, I'll keep going. But say if you've got someone that doesn't, or even a bench press. You know, like you've seen people. I sort of, you know, younger friends and stuff like that that get on a bench press and they're like all over the place. Yeah. How do you sort of develop all those, you know, those stabilization, the, the stabilization through yeah. this? Can, can that be done Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah you're, you're, um, 
You have a little more freedom with X3 because it's not just going to come crashing down on you. It's going to come crashing down on you, except you can slow it way down and you need very nominal force to control it as it comes down. Mm. So if something goes wrong, like let's say a younger person, teenager, like they have limitless confidence, yet not the ability to match. So they can try and use like a, a band that's too heavy because they all will do that. And then they'll find out, oh, like I can't control it. And then they go to the lower band and it's fine. I guess. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. So a lot of success with like, teenagers using it. They're not going to hurt themselves. Right. Uh, I mean, they could, but the chances are much lower. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Right. So let's give this row a, a try then. See what we're doing next. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, let me do a set. Yeah. Now, one thing I've got to say about the row. I'll say this before I'm out of breath, because I will be. Uh, the row is a very unique moment because the curve of power of the bicep and the lat come together in a weird way where actually the middle is the most powerful position. It's only, only multi-joint movement in the body where the fully contracted position is not. So the, the lats work okay. a little differently. And it's mostly because the lats have a, uh, a different curve. So what I end up doing is uh, only a few repetitions go full and then I might do 30 mid-range repetitions. Mm. So the diminishing range here is super important. But and that, that's how, because we get questions like, well, the curve is different for each exercise. Yeah, we thought of that and that's, that's part of the programming. There's a whole chapter just on the row in the book and how its curve is so drastically different from almost everything else. I'm just gonna pull it up. I'm also gonna tip up at a, like a kind of a 45 degree angle, which is something I recommend for people with bad backs. I don't have a bad back, Me. but almost <laughs> everybody has, a, has something with yeah. their lower spine. So like instead of being just parallel with the ground, a uh, 45 degree angle right. is pretty good. You're not letting it fully out at the bottom. No, no, I never let my arms go straight. So keeping constant tension. Okay, so I can't get to the top anymore. Yeah. So now I just do these. Partials because it's all I can do. But it's with a lower weight, so I can fatigue much more muscle. <clears throat> <clears throat> Alright, let's give that a go. Yeah. <laughs> I can feel that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Got my, got my heart into the green zone. It's all right for standing That's there, right. lifting a band. Really? <laughs> I can slowly start to sort of feel how, it's work, how, it, how it works. Yeah. I couldn't get that by looking at just the... Uh, well, so many really? people have had so <laughs> many experiences just grabbing a band at the gym yeah. and stepping on it and trying to do a curl and their wrists are twisting yeah. while they're doing it and they're like, ah, oh, this sucks. Yeah. Like I'll just get some dumbbells. Yeah. And I understand, I just knew what humans were capable of in the strongest range because of my bone density medical device. So that's how I knew. Cause I, I saw little old ladies put six times their body weight 
through their hip joint the first training session because we had just isolated the impact ready range. Right. And these are women who never worked out. They're osteoporotic and they're in their mid 50s. So totally deconditioned by any definition. And they're massively loading the body because they're using a millimeter of range of motion. Right. So I'm thinking if a human body is capable of producing that level of force, well, we don't use it when we work out. So maybe lifting weights is not the answer. Hmm. Obviously this is for you know, people who want to build muscle, but say for example you're like my dad, like 70, 75, yeah. and obviously their muscle really drops off when you get to that age. Yeah. Is this something for sort of older people as well where they, okay, maybe they don't go like what we're doing. My here, dad's but... 88 and he does it. Right. Now there's, you gotta make sure that they're okay. Like he has, he has some gout issues, he has some joint issues. You know, like art, like my dad's generation, they were just sort of, um, oh, you know, it'll heal up. Like, right. so they'll throw themselves into an injury position to sort of get the job done. And uh, yeah, I saw him do like yard work that would just like destroy his joints when yeah. I was a kid. And uh, he liked doing it, so he did it. And uh, now he's paying for it. So we know a lot more about how important keeping our joints healthy mm. are. Like our, our parents' generation just like threw that shit in the trash. Mm. Yeah, we do work with an older person. You gotta totally be mindful of their limitations. Right. You know, like for example, when he does a row, he either grabs over the top because he doesn't have the ability to supinate the right. hand, okay. or he'll use globe grips. You know what globe grips are? No. It's a sphere, it's a latex sphere with a slit in it, and then it's got a hole the size of a gauge, an Olympic oh, gauge. Okay. Yeah, I know and so it mean, snaps yeah. onto the bar, and so you can adjust your wrist. Right. And with the, with, this, with, the, with the muscle building part, have you done any testing to show like we won? Because it feels like I've got, a, I've got a, quite a pump on with my back, and definitely yeah. feel as I've done a good set, or mm -hmm. a few sets. Have you been able to sort of see what that does in terms of building muscle over time? Have you, have, have, has that been researched? Or? It's, it's been anything that I do, you know, someone's going to say like the data was faked or whatever. So, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of trolls out there. And so I'd rather somebody else come up with this conclusion. So there's a couple of university trials that are, we're talking about happening. Also, one of the, I think one of the reasons why the fitness industry doesn't read research. I mean, number one, it's hard. You got to be an academic to read academic research, uh, mostly because of the statistical tests. If you don't understand the statistical tests, it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. The whole paper is meaningless. So, muscle mass is not a thing in medicine. Like it's like nobody cares. So, and it doesn't solve any problem. Well, we know it kind of does because a lack of muscle mass, sarcopenia is a, an indicator of organ failure, mm -hmm. right? So your muscles and your organs have a very symbiotic relationship. Like the more, the, the more muscle mass you have, the more demand you have on your organs and that's gonna keep you alive longer, which is why one of the greatest indicators of long life is high levels of strength. But they don't say high levels of mass. Mm -hmm. So it's really, like you won't find muscle mass, maybe body composition and weight loss studies. That's about all you're gonna find about muscle mass in, in a lot of these studies, because that's, that's just, that's what's tested. Hmm. Yeah. And what's the difference, I was, it's funny, I was watching it, I was watching Mike Chandler, we had an Olympic bar on a rack with a band like this, but with, a, um, with two Olympic plates on. So what, what would be the difference of doing this as opposed to doing it with like, um, you know, an Olymp a, a, on a real Olympic bar with some weights, whether it's squatting the same movements, what's the pros and the cons? With yeah, so, so putting bands on a bar, that can be done. Yeah. And like, like if you're training for a powerlifting event, you might want to do that. Yeah. Uh, or you could use X3 and then do your powerlifting, that would make more sense. But um, the problem with that is, the highest degrees of variance have shown the best results. That is in research that I did not do. Right. So other researchers came to that conclusion. So, and it's really important when, when so that way there's no conflict of interest. I don't even know the guys that came to that conclusion. But um, you really want 
you want the proper level of variance. So like it's seven to one in a one rep max, you're seven times stronger here than you are here. Right. But that we don't live in a one rep max world. In fact, one rep maxes don't really stimulate any growth. They're kind of stupid. Uh, so if you're gonna break down, you know, like into a repetition scheme, the ratio's a little different. It might be five to one. That's a huge level of variance. So what most people have weights on a bar and bands on a bar, they might hold, be holding X here and 1.2X here mm -hmm. or 1.5X here. So there's not enough variance. Right, whereas we're X here and 5X here. Okay. So the variance curve has gotten huge. Right. And in fact, one of the problems with bands is bands are linear. They, they go up like this. Well, what the human body does, it goes up like this. So it's sort of like weak, a little less weak, you know, maybe, maybe some sort of medium strength and then crazy strength. Right. And that's also why a fighter never wants to hit somebody, you know, a couple inches from their body. They want to meet them at full extension. If there's a 120 degree angle of inclusion right here, when the fighter connects with somebody, they might get knocked out. Other than that, probably not. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's that variance in, in from the weakest range to the, or to the shortest part of the range to the greatest. And if you put plates on it, you're not getting that same You're just getting a flat line in the Variance, right, yeah. okay. Like you have a curve like this, and the bar is just dead flat. Yeah. Like it's the same weight the whole time. Mm -hmm. That's not how muscle physiology okay. works. It's interesting. And that, that's why the title I chose the book is Weightlifting is a Waste of Time. Because yeah. I can prove that. Yeah. I can prove it with 16 different studies. And there's an additional 250 different supporting ones throughout the book that talk about different aspects of training that just either make sense or don't make sense. Mm. Yeah. So what's next then? Uh, well, this one would, I suppose, be optional for some. Like Ben Greenfield, he doesn't do bicep curls. No. And he's like, and it was really funny because the first time we met, I've been on his podcast twice. The first time we met was on his podcast. Uh, we had talked on the phone once or twice. But he, he thought he was going to ask me like a gotcha question. He's like, all right, tell me why in the world, by the way, we're doing a drag curl here. What's that's it? So most people do curls like this where they have, hold the most weight here. Okay. That's not smart. Right. Because that's not even where you're firing the most amount of muscle. A drag curl is when you drag it up your body. Uh, okay. So. And tell, for, explain why. What, what's it? Yes. Yeah, just there's much more of a contraction in the bicep. Right, if you're putting your shoulders yeah. back and, okay. Now it works a lot better when you have variable resistance like this. Yeah. But anyway, so Ben Greenfield goes, why the hell do you have bicep curls in there? Like no one's doing specific, you know, like arm work anymore except for bodybuilders. And I'm like, girls. He goes, what do you mean girls? I'm like, you like when girls look at your arms, right? And he goes, you know what, man, I got nothing. He goes, I was really gonna rake you over the coals for that. And yeah, I don't have a scientific answer for that. <laughs> the reason we work biceps is so we look good. Well, I guess it's a tiny muscle ready compared to others. So, do you, so in terms of the bicep stuff, I guess, do you like one set and that's it then? Yep. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Go for it. How often do you do? Like, so I split the body two different ways. Um, so there's a push-pull split. And uh, so I... Yeah, I hit every body part twice a week, three times a week, sorry. Three times a week. Yeah, so six workouts a week and then one day off. All right. And at the bottom, <laughs> where do I stop? About here? Yeah. Yeah? I'm not used to doing this kind of curl, but... I don't think you'll ever curl another way now that we've gone over <laughs> this. It's just so much more in game time. You, know, you are only working a small muscle right now, but your heart rate's still through the roof. You can see on the monitor. Good. And, and when I'm starting yeah. to fatigue. Yep, you're right there, so just go here. It's 
Still do your drag curl, still pull back. Still keep it near your body. Here you go. Check that out. Yeah, well, 77%. It's not bad for curls. I can, I can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, you get a lot of blood flow there. Yeah, you do. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. <laughs> yeah, you do. It does give you a great pump, I guess, uh, compared to other stuff. I suppose probably, you know, I suppose doing slower, more controlled, constant tension and what the bands do, it, it's different than, I suppose, you know, doing your dumbbell curls where probably a lot of it. Well, when, you're, when you're at the top of a dumbbell curl, especially if you throw your elbow out, you know, the resistance is here. And then once you bring it parallel, are you holding anything? Yeah, no. You're not holding anything. We talked earlier about air. I've, I'd sort of, we've got some Kaiser stuff and I, you know, getting in different positions to try and do that. So you've got to kind of, you've got to work a little bit to use regular machines to sort of get that same thing. Sure. And you do get the, like the, the only downside with doing that, like on a few exercises that I've tried, although I do like the Kaiser stuff, is that when you are then at the bottom, you really, you kind of feel as though you sort of, it's a little bit too heavy. Like obviously, once you get it moving, I suppose with this, getting it moving isn't no, the problem. No, because the curve of that power delivery is different than your yeah. curve. Yeah, I, this I, is I make sense now, yeah. yeah. Or, or highly similar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the same, no, we can't get the same for everybody. Yeah. But yeah, w way more similar than anything else. So let's do an overhead press. So one thing that's really important, and when someone's lifting free weights, the top position is so dangerous, they don't really think about much. But I tell people, it's probably better if I go profile here, put your head through the window. So arms, you want to rotate the whole shoulder so that it does this. See what I'm right. talking about? So as I come up, boom. Like, I, it's way behind my ears. Right. And the reason is you really squeeze the deltoid. Because that's the full contracted deltoid position. Also the safest position. Really? Uh, yeah, and I, and I kind of tilt my rib cage a little upward and I keep my eyes aimed up. Right. Because I see guys doing an overhead press and they're looking down. And there's just something biomechanically, I don't, I don't have a study to back this up, but there's something that wouldn't make sense biomechanically. If we were to hold something heavy, wouldn't we keep our eye on it? Mm. You wouldn't look away. No. Yeah, like when I drive a car really fast, I don't try and close my eyes. <laughs> right. So to get into position, I drop down, pick up the bar. Notice the speed. So how are you counting on that speed then, John? Yeah. So what, what, how many seconds up and down then? Two up, two down. And you're just stopping about your nose. Yep. Yeah. Look at him, he's got these little bands and he's struggling with it. <laughs> that looks tough. Uh, I think that one's like... I'm, I'm joking. For a six foot tall guy, six one guy, that's... 
maybe 70 pounds at the top. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just jump under a 70 pound bar and no. hold it over your head. No. But here it's light here and it's only heavy work counts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's give this now. Now I'm going to make myself look foolish. I'm going to be able to move it. <laughs> So is there any benefit of coming down slower than uh, two seconds? There can be. Now, the two seconds up, two seconds down was a theory I had because I know about muscle control, stabilization firing, and you read the meta-analysis that uh, Henry Alkire and I did where we look at stabilization firing and growth hormone upregulation. Right, yeah. So slower and controlled is way better. Now. What I also found is that slow and controlled gets you to complete muscular failure before you run out of oxygenated blood. Mm. So, like, I'm out of breath now, but I'm done with the exercise. I didn't run out of breath during the exercise so that it was the limiting factor. Okay. So, and it actually, it took a magnifying glass into my breath control to understand this, and I knew how do I limit my respiration so that I can see if limiting, if limiting my airflow uh, is really my failure point or not. And then, then coronavirus happened. Right. And I was like, awesome, all I need to do is get coronavirus. And then I'll be able to actually tell, tell if I can complete a workout by going slower go to complete muscular exhaustion with compromised respiration. Mm. So I couldn't wait to get it <laughs> so I could work out with it. So like, I, I like seriously went to the mall and started like licking doorknobs. Not quite that bad, but I like <laughs> grabbed the railing and then just like rub my nose and be like, oh, I got it. There's gotta be a thousand people that touch that, that in the shopping mall. Yeah, that's exactly how I got it. <laughs> I wanted to get it so bad. So, but, but that's, that's what, how I figured out that the slow and controlled really made sure that it was muscular tissue going to fatigue. Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, just for the camera here, see how the band's a little frayed right in here? Keep yeah. Going. Keep going. That's normal. See, latex is very soft material, and so sometimes the top layers get a little banged up. You know, it's like a, it's like a set of tires. A new set of tires only looks near the day. You get them, drive around in them a little bit. They don't look pretty anymore, but they will do the job. I've had these bands for three years. This is my travel bands. So they kind of live in my suitcase. And when you fail it. Yeah, now, now just short reps. So, no, 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 short at the bottom. Bring it down. Yeah, right there. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, I'm in the yellow zone. Oh, I was. So I've been. It was 80? <laughs> yeah. 50 years old, so I'm a bit, and I've worked out, and I'm kind of a bit tight and creaky, and yeah. I was a bit worried about this because, you know, back and Shoulders we talked about, but actually, um, oh, it's, it's, easy. it's easy on joints. It is really so nice easy on, on joints. joints. This is how I get some of these NFL guys. They don't want to try anything because they're like, "Yeah, everybody told me to try something, I get hurt." Yeah, and you know, they just watch this work and they're like, "I think that's really going to be nice on my joints." And and then they try it one time and then they're like, "I'm in. This is the best workout I've ever had." And then they call me three or four weeks later and they're like, "I'm as fast as I was at the combine." Well, I was actually, yeah. before I came here, I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I did work out yesterday and I was, I was a bit worried that I was going to get positions where it actually hurt. Um, mm -hmm. But it's totally the opposite, actually. I can, I can push 
without feeling any twinges, which is, uh, which is quite nice. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and anybody with a, with a compromised joint, um, they're actually, so like our customer typically is somebody who's injured something. Right. Because they, they look at it and they're like, I could get a heavy workout without totally trashing my joints. Now, people who are in their 20s, no offense, uh, they think th that injuries are for losers. And yeah, it's not I, gonna I happen when I was younger. I was, yeah, it's not, that's never gonna happen to me. I didn't have to warm up yeah, or yeah. just right. straight into uh, it. No, I'm tough. I'm never gonna be <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, see you in 10 years. That's what happens. Yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah. when, you, when you do a bench press, yeah. let's say you're shooting for like seven repetitions, what would you put on the bar? Um, I, I don't know, like 60, 70, 75 kilos, six, between 60 and 70. Okay. So let me get the let me get this out of the way for a second. Oh, and I'll be interested in this because I did uh, I did some uh, bench last night and I sort of felt this. So I'll be curious to see. And I, I think it's like what you say, you know, because you're it's the same weight all the way down. It, for me, it was always it was at the bottom. Of course, um, it always but, is. But then obviously I'm not getting because I, I I was able to press more, but I couldn't. I couldn't get enough weight on because of the injury at the, <sighs> at, at the lower point. Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't get the weight that I felt I wanted to lift because yeah. it, it hurt. Uh, where this sort of obviously takes it off at the bottom. And, okay. and so what's, is there any negative about sort of taking it off at the bottom? Is it, it, apart, it, I guess it protects your joints. So um, there's a study done in 1994 by uh, Swapon Mukherjee and um, Nick Radimus. And you probably remember Nick Radimus' name. He's published all kinds of great strength papers. Uh, claims he doesn't know me, but we met once. <laughs> kind of pissed me off a little bit. Uh, but Swapon, he remembers me. And that's, that's his PhD advisor. Um, and so they, they wrote this great article about limited range of motion in the strong range and how it translates to all ranges of motion. So when you get stronger in the stronger range, you automatically become stronger in the weaker range proportionately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Interesting. yeah, like, and this is why, like, when, when, um, I hate using bodybuilding examples, but everybody knows who he is. So, Ronnie Coleman, you know, uh, he did a lot of things, injured himself, mm -hmm. like, almost everything he does, I would say not to do. However, he was the biggest bodybuilder that ever lived. And you ever notice he didn't ever use a full range of motion? No. I mean, his bench press was like this. Like, there, he was only doing about half the movement with an insane amount of weight. Yeah. Like, he never went down and touched his chest. M maybe it was about like right here to right here, and he never locked out either. So he was always applying constant tension. And he was always using what he would call the sweet spot of the exercise, mm. which was maybe only 50% of the movement. Right. And so you don't really need the weak range really at all, but you do need a range of motion. This is why isometrics don't work, because you don't get any blood flow from isometrics. Right. So like isometric studies always come out like so that people think like an amazing thing is gonna happen. Really what you get is neurological adaptations. You fire more muscle faster. That's really all they do. You're not getting any hypertrophy from that because you need to exhaust ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate as you move. You need to exhaust the fuels and only motion exhausts the fuels. So you have to have that, but if you want to bypass a little bit of that weak range, um, in fact, when you bench, put a, put a four by four block of wood on your chest and just hit it and then go back up. I remember you used to doing that years, yeah. years and years ago in, my, in the old bodybuilding days. Although they did do the opposite as well. They had, a, they had one of those kind of like L bars or whatever. It, you know, <laughs> It is self-promotion of me to just say, just, just everyone should just use X3. But I see people just screwing around with all kinds of equipment that they brought to the gym and they're running some little scientific experiment. And it's like, <laughs> it's not that hard, but you guys have been given such bad information. How do I unwind that? You know, mm -hmm. like a lot of these guys, like they want to believe the complicated way is the right way. It's really not that complicated. Like we just have, very different power from here to here to here to here. Work out accordingly. Yeah. And I developed a device for it. Or, or you can try and figure out the proper ratios in a gym. And, and that was another thing. I want to tell people about what ratios of loading they really need. But then everybody's going into the gym with their own equipment, which they're not allowed to do, by the way. Gyms don't want you to do that. Oh, you're not insured. It's not, yeah, they're not insured. <laughs> so they get super mad when you bring in your own stuff to a gym. And so it's just like, just get X3 and use it at home. Yeah. Like it's real, or, or use it with your buddies in your garage or whatever. Uh, 
Anyway, so chest press. Mm-hmm. Do you do you think you tap into the sort of like our age as opposed like it seems as though a lot of your customers, lot, yeah, or, or even just people who sort of follow social media that seem to be kind of more of a younger age group. Do you do you, do you sort of um, do you, do you put, pick up like you know forties, fifty year olds, the sort of people who probably in, in the beginning, in the beginning, the sort of the first movers were probably mid fifties down right. to mid thirties. Yeah, yeah. Now it's mid twenties yeah. to mid forties, but we're still strong in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. So it is. It's really like all. Oh, I, I can see the appeal of like me when I was twenty. It's like okay, you know, build muscle quick. So I'm going to keep constant tension. I'm not going to lock out at the top. I'm not going to let the band go slack at the bottom. Um, I'm going to push slightly down. Okay. So a slight decline, not a total decline, but a slight decline is the path of least resistance of the chest press. Now, interesting thing about X3, you can go any direction that you know, your joints would take you. It just so happens that people do one of two things. They either arch the shit out of their back and press what looks like straight, <laughs> which is actually a decline, right? It's a slight decline. So I tell people there's nothing wrong with slight decline. You're still activating all the, all the stuff. And because the body wants to go there, that tells me that there's probably the least chance of injury. And there's been a few papers on that, not enough to be like 100% about it, because there's all kinds of conflicting research in that, in that space. Also, the shoulder is the most complex joint in the human body, also the one that injures the most. Mm-hmm. It also has the most range of motion of any joint in the body. Right. So, it's not a mystery. So, okay. Oh, another thing I like to do is hyperventilate before a set. Ready? Because you only got one set to do. So, if you got one set to do, you want it to be the best set. Right. So you want hyper oxygenated blood going into it. So, so I, what would you do then? How would... Until I get dizzy. So I just went through, you know, best chest workout of my life or equivalent to the other workouts I do with X3. I didn't need a spotter, didn't need a lot of equipment, didn't go to a gym. This thing, you know, fits in a drawer or in the backpack I brought it down in. So, and I'm done. So with what, my chest for Tell me about hours. this hyperventilating thing. What is that doing? Um, uh, it's just getting more oxygen, more oxygen in your blood. You. Okay. Yeah. Because once and now this is this is pretty technical and i describe it in detail in the book i feel like people would much prefer to read technical stuff because they can kind of go over it and over and maybe look up a word but i try so by keeping constant tension and by hyper oxygenating the blood you have very little blood flow in or out of the muscle when you keep constant tension right so with variable resistance and constant tension only, or, or if you have tourniquets, uh, you get the blood flow restriction. So blood stays in the musculature. Well, all of a sudden, your cardiovascular system sees some muscle is missing. So it down regulates myostatin. Myostatin is a protein in your body that limits your muscle growth. Hmm. So the limit on muscle growth gets taken away with every set that I do like that. Okay. Therefore, you can grow beyond your genetic potential. So that so myostatin prevents muscle growth. Right. Right. And so so how so just so how do you how do so how do you get rid of that myostatin? So myostatin is really regulated by the heart. 
Okay. When the heart is pumping blood to a muscle that's not receiving it, yeah. it's almost like it's gone. Okay. So the heart says, okay, we lost some muscle. Yeah. So let's downregulate myostatin. Okay. And therefore enable the body to grow more musculature. Right. Okay. Right. So that's why the concentration oh, right. is so important. Okay. And it doesn't really work with weights because constant tension with weights when you're in the strong range is almost no tension yeah, yeah. because it's super easy. So is that where they strap? Is that that sort That's of the tourniquet. Yeah. Tourniquet. Yeah. So you're getting the same benefit of the tourniquet training. Problem with the tourniquet training is your body knows you're on a tourniquet. Okay. So it won't let you engage very much muscle. So you see people Why when they do blood flow restriction, then? yeah, they're holding tiny weights. Right. How does it know it's, it's on a tourniquet then? I mean, like, you can feel it, right? Right, okay. Yeah, so it, it knows there's a restrictive, you know, external measure. Whereas when you're doing this, it doesn't recognize there's something, it just thinks that it's not there anymore, is it? Right, right, right. right. Okay. okay, interesting. Mm. Right, let's give this one a go. <clears throat> this is the one in all the, in all the pictures. I've been, wondering what this, I've, I've been wondering what this feels like, because in the pictures it looks awkward. Um, does it? Yeah, it does. And I'm like, okay, I'm, okay. I'm not sure about that. So I'm going to so give it a the go. elbows. So elbows like elbows this. Elbows out, yeah. Yeah. yeah let, me, let me just make sure you're, you're all, yeah. yeah cool. Okay. I'm going all the way out. Yeah, right to the right. Just not a lock. Just not, like not, this. Not quite a lock. So to there. Yep. Okay. And then mm -hmm. where do I Let stop? Let it come back a little bit and we'll drag it down a little bit more. You got it a little high here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Up. Good. Up. Good. Up. Good. You don't have to Valsalva. You can keep air moving. That's a hard thing for you to get used to. You've been lifting a long time. No, no, the, the partial reps are closer. Yeah, there you go. Ah, it's easier. Good. That's my heart rate. How you feeling? Feel good. No, no pain. My shoulder's good. Right, you just <laughs> gained absolute fatigue, deeper fatigue than you've probably gone in, what, 15 years? <laughs> With chest, you have no joint. How does that feel? Get a, my tricep. Yeah. Uh, got a good, good pump in my tricep. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do tricep specific next. Right. Yeah, it, it, it looks, in the picture it looks awkward, but it actually feels, uh, feels quite nice. It's a bit diff different to sort of with the close grip, but you can, you can, you can get a lot well, you, you got better contraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I, I understand it's not what people have been told, but hey, guess what? You can be told something that's incorrect. Yeah. Like, I mean, just ask Anthony Fauci. He reverses his position on everything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's easier. So, oh, you always see, wait, 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 wait. Let me show you the better way to get yeah. into this. Okay. So, don't throw the band around yourself like you just did. <laughs> it's easiest if you start like this, put it over your shoulder, keep the bands together. Right. Then drop it you know, swing the bar in front of you. So it's basically cross body, then drop it over the deltoid. Then. Right. Okay. So the bands never get separated. Yeah. When you do that, but you'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, you want to do the uh, triceps now? Triceps or, le or legs? We can do some legs just to. I wasn't like... planning. To, did, you, think you got energy to do legs? Yeah. Contrary to what my troll said, don't skip leg day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also not five foot four like some of the bodybuilders that they watch. 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, when you're shorter, everything is bigger. Well, not everything, right, sweetheart? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So very similar to chest press. It's like a skull crusher. You start like this, but you want to act like your elbows are glued to your ribs. Uh huh. Like you can't move them. Okay. And I'm just going. I, I like to bend my knees and kind of tilt my body downward. All right. Uh, just so I'm not conscious of like locking my knees out, which is something I do when I'm like. You know, a lot of tension going through my body. Uh, so I just want to make sure everything's relaxed and then I hinge just at that joint. Now try what I said. Hold it like this. Like this. Yeah. Put it over there, yeah? You know, over your head. And then keep it together. And then you bring it cross body. Yep. Yeah, just let yeah. it roll like that. And then you just drop this one over. Yeah. Then you're in position. Yeah. Perfect. Now elbows hugged inside of your body. And oh, don't do a suicide grip. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We want to keep our teeth. <laughs> right? There you go. Just a bit. Uh... Don't lock out. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that was a mistake. Here, let me fix it. Okay. So just to Hinge. there. Yeah, but don't press it. Hinge. Is that right? Yep. Where do I stop at the top there? Uh huh. Yeah, just before the tension lets off. So again, the weight's you know, maybe 150 on this. So we just go high reps for, so just get to about right here. Yeah. 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 Good. It's good, nice feel. Can do a lot more there. <laughs> no, no, after, after and that's the point. You, you, can, you can go to such a deep level of fatigue. Yeah. I'm glad your fans are seeing, like, first of all, they see me get exhausted and they'll be like, oh, he's faking it. But they see you getting exhausted, like, all right, I, yeah, I, I trust Matt. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, it's it's real thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can definitely feel where I'm training. Do you, yeah. do, you do ab stuff as well on that? Or? So I find that just the engagement from the deadlift. Yeah. And so abs are a stabilizing muscle. Right. So you know what happens when you exercise a stabilizing muscle consciously? Nothing. Uh, right. Because it's a stabilizer. It's, it's like there are, there's a lot of muscles in the body, obliques and quadratus, where like I see guys like grabbing a dumbbell and doing like side bends, 
you know, with uh, to, to try and engage the obliques and quadrates. And are they engaging them? Yeah, but that's that's not really what the abs are there for. It, they're they're stabilizers. And then the other thing is like I see guys, especially bodybuilders, building big abs, and their abs actually make their waist look wide. Right. And and they're also building their obliques and quadrates. So. I tell people focus on being lean and you got the engagement from from the, the squats, right. the deadlifts and the overhead, overhead press. press. Right. So you, you don't yeah, they, I tell people don't don't really work your abs and there's a lot of bodybuilders that only start doing ab work right before the show. Mm -hmm. So there's they pop out but you know, I'm not missing abs. Right. So yeah. Okay, so last one then legs. Yeah, that's your arms. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just feeling them. They feel, okay. feel like <laughs> they, 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 you, you do get a hell of a pump on. That's one thing yes. I would say. <laughs> yes. So, John, thanks, uh, thanks for that workout. We're just chatting out off the yeah. camera, and I, and I was, I was a skeptic, um, and um, I thought it was a weird contraption. I thought it was a bit small, I, I, and I, I, I thought the exercises looked a little bit, you know, in the pictures. I, I felt they looked a little bit kind of. I don't know, like in weird positions, it just seemed like the, the deadlift and that, and particularly the squat, I thought, oh, I'm really gonna to struggle to get a good leg workout. But I have to admit, I'm not selling this, I'm not making any and money out of this you whatsoever. No financial benefit okay. at all. <laughs> but I, I, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the best feels I've had from a leg workout um, for a long time. And, nice. um, and I, yeah, I think it's good, a, a great product. And the other thing, mm. as we're talking about, as I get a little bit older and stiffer, injuries, shoulders, back, and, and I, yeah. I like the, the band effect because it seems to just take off, it, it, you know, eases the, um, the, the pressure. Pressure on the joint. On the joint, right. which kind of puts you, or puts, puts me off doing certain exercises because it hurts. And, and where I, I didn't get, I didn't get, apart from the pain in the muscle, I didn't get any pain whatsoever That's in right. any of the joints, which I think is pretty interesting. And you won't have any pain tomorrow. Right. No. No, apart from maybe some aching, maybe. <laughs> uh, you'll feel muscles, you won't feel aching in joints. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing I wanted to ask, because it's a very, uh, we, we chat, it's a, it seems, it's a very sort of mas masculine looking, you know, you've got you, big, bald, uh, I'm not very, guy. I'm not very feminine, <laughs> sorry. But I wanted to chat, my, my wife kind of set, set this whole interview up, but I wanted to chat with, you know, with your, your partner here about, um, you know, women in this type of training, because, you know, you, you sort of, uh, I guess people want to get, or my wife wants to get, stay in shape, um, you know, wants to, a nice look lean, but also uh, kind of get those curves in the right place. You know, what, how does this apply from a female perspective then? You know, what, you, you, I guess, have been using this. Right, I use this almost every day and it's so much better than a standard workout for me. Um, I don't have to go to the gym and be embarrassed about what I'm doing or, have guys looking at me, I kind of just go into my workout. Um, my fitness goals personally are to have a smaller waist and then bigger glutes and quads. And so I use this specifically for my legs. And Is that a typical sort of, is that like what, we were talking about the women on Instagram, but is, is that, like men don't want to train their legs and right. chest and biceps, is, right. is, is that the opposite then for females in general? I definitely think it's, it's becoming the opposite for a lot of women. They want to look a little bit more feminine, um, have smaller, leaner arms, and then a curvier lower half for sure. And um, especially with my generation, I mean, we we just want to look as good as possible in our own bodies. And it, it's made me it's made me grow a lot in my glutes since I started it, and it's it's been really good. If anyone's serious about training, they train at full exhaustion. I just, I just don't want somebody who's like 50 years old to like see, you know, like an untrained 50 year old to see that and go, ah, that's not for me. No. Yeah. But you build I, up to I, it, uh, so. I like it because, uh, um, you know, particularly, I'm not trying to do this as a promotion for the product, I'm just to explain more for the feeling, but um, through the pandemic, I've been at home, I do plenty of stuff for upper body, but I like, you know, I think my wife always says to me, you know, this is kind of, men think this is what they like, but ladies women, apparently like <laughs> Women, right? <laughs> Which I obviously can't see. So right. my wife likes me to train my legs, uh, and I like to train my legs. It makes me feel good and powerful, but 
It's very difficult to get at home uh, anything that... Heavy enough. Really, yeah. Yeah. Without buying a squat rack. Um, and I've tried a bunch of things. I get, you know, the best I've got is a couple of pair of 50 pound dumbbells, uh, just banging out some reps. Uh, but that, that's nice. Good. So is that, we've we done the whole body then, have we? You didn't do calves. You want to do calves? Come on, let's do calves, come on. All right. Let's finish it off. My car's cramping up. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did do a whole body workout today. <laughs> I just want to try that um, single leg split squat just to get just to see what that feels. I don't want to do too many, but it's on. Okay. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now bias your weight right on this quad. It gives, uh, gives you jelly legs. Yep. And what, what, do, what are you, what sort of stuff, you, you told me about these, uh, what, what are they called, split squats, is that right, we did? Yeah, single, yeah. single leg squat, split squat. Right, yeah. is, that what, is that what you're doing then for mm -hmm. your glutes and? Yeah, so I do the deadlift and then the split squat. And then I also do calf raises because I want um, my calves to have a little bit of definition, but other than that, that's. Well, you do overhead press too. I also do the overhead press. For um, some definition in the back. For my back, yeah. And then also the hourglass figure. It helps make my waist look a little bit smaller. Right. Yeah. So that's what I like. How, many, how often are you doing it then? This, this, uh, how often are you working well, out? Well, so she's this? doing it. That, that's sort of like her whole workout. So she'll do that maybe twice a week. Mm -hmm. So she hits every body part twice. Right. Yeah. Right. And so what else do you do? Or is that just, just that? That's it. Yeah? That's all I do. Yeah. <laughs> How long are you working out for then? Um, I've been working out for two years in total. I used to be seriously skinny. Um, I used to be about 98 pounds. I'm 5'6". So that was a little bit underweight for me. And I wanted to just add some muscle on, get some curves on my lower half. And um, it's been so easy with X3. And I've only been doing it for a few months now. And I've Three seen, months. Yeah, I've seen exceptional growth. I mean, my glutes are... They look like I've been training for years, so <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Do you think you got more out of the last couple months than you did out of the previous two years? A hundred percent. Yeah, so I get that a lot. This, I get emails every day that say like, I've been training for 10 years and I've made more progress with X3 in six months than I did in the 10 previous years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's a common <clears throat> misconception for going to the gym and kind of gaining weight if that's your goal, which it was mine. Um, I was eating a lot. I was eating a lot just to be able to go to the gym and have my two hour workout that I normally had. And it, I felt like it, if anything, I was kind of getting a little bit fatter than putting on muscle. Well, look at me, I'm not so, agreeing with that. Yeah, so. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> so what were you eating then? Were you, what sort of food are you eat, were you eating then or are you eating now? You changed your diet at all? I did change my diet. So now I'm eating. Um, Carnivore. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm on a carnivore diet with him, and I'm eating once a day, so I eat All right. at dinner time. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I don't. I don't do the dry fasting. I still drink liquids throughout the day. Um, he's a little bit different. He, um, you just drink beer. <laughs> yeah, he's a little more strict on that than I am. But I think it's nice for women to have a little bit of fat in the areas that we naturally store the fat, like you know the breasts and the butt. So that's um, I. I've, with eating only meat, I've noticed that I don't have as much body fat and I'm just more defined everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you have any of the protein? Do you have the Fortigen as well? You can take that or not. I don't know if that's a male or female <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, so pro, uh, Fortigen is a way, like each dose makes up for 50 grams of high quality protein. Uh, well, I should say it makes up for 50 grams of low quality protein which you would normally uh, uh, be getting. So it like basically counts as like half a, half a pound of steak. Right. And so uh, 
She doesn't particularly need that at her body weight. She can eat uh, one gram per pound of body weight in protein. Um, but some, like, if you want to eat less and have a greater caloric restriction in your meals and then uh, have, like, one dose of Fortigen is only four calories. People go insane when I say that, but sorry, guys, it's the truth. Uh, uh, mostly because incomplete proteins don't count as a caloric load at all because they're just building blocks. So uh, there's only, so we have four calories that are in there, and it makes up for half a pound of like a fillet. And then so she can do that, <clears throat> and then do uh, do a smaller meal, or she can just have a bigger meal. Right. Yeah. So you're just having some meat. Once it, what, in the evening, are you? Yeah, I, I do. That's all I do. <laughs> and no, 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 like carbs or anything with that? Or? Um, occasionally I'll have some mashed potatoes alongside with my filet or whatever, but other than that, no. That's, that's all I do. And at the weekend, do you, do you, do you have it every day or do you that's, change? Yeah, that's every day. <laughs> it's pretty easy to stick to. Yeah? So, like, at yeah, first, you get used to it. at first I was telling everybody, like, you need to do intermittent fasting. You need to be carnivore. Um, one meal a day is like, that was sort of my view of the world when I wasn't fasting. Mm -hmm. Even though that is fasting. So uh, I was really militant about it and I got great results. But when I figured out, I did a survey and I figured out how many of the customers were actually doing what I, what I was instructing them to do. Yeah, the, the compliance was poor. Hmm. Uh, so most people would, were willing to like cut out sugar from the diet, uh, cut out processed foods. So that that's not a stretch. But when you tell them, you know, just just eat meat and just eat once a day. Uh, so now I'm a little more because Fortigen provides the quality protein without a caloric impact. Now when it comes to the meal, like even when I eat a meal, it might only be 1,500 calories. Right. So I have, you know, let's say uh, a pound of fillet. And then you know, there's a couple of vegetables or some other carbohydrate or something like that. I can have that, and it's not going to be a problem. So you just at what time in the evening would you have that then? Um, I prefer an earlier dinner. Yeah. Just so I'm kind of empty, you know, by the, by the time I go to sleep. I don't like digesting. It's just a, it's a sleep quality thing. Anybody ever done a sleep monitor? You've done a sleep monitor, right? Yeah. You notice if you <laughs> eat before you go to bed, or if you drink really any alcohol before you go to bed, your sleep is not that yeah. great. Yeah. And if you have a huge meal and you drink a whole lot of alcohol, <laughs> your sleep is just awful. Yeah. Yeah. So just trying to try to avoid that that sort of thing. So I, I prefer to sleep better. And what about in the morning? So when you wake up and you work out, then do you just work out on an empty stomach? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. My workouts are usually right before dinner though. Okay. So I, I like a okay. later in the day workout normally. Uh, you're just special. <laughs> so you got a midday workout out of me. Look at that. By the way, nobody's ever done that. No. Nah. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple of film crews that are like, well, we're going to be there at 9 a.m. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Yes. And do you, think, is it, do you find it easy then to stick to that, like every day, like just, just the one meal? Thing? So I'm the worst person to ask that question because when I decide I'm going to do something, even if it's totally unreasonable, I'll do it. Right. Uh, just for results. And I've always had willpower like that. Caroline is more like a normal person <laughs> yeah. who is just not going to completely throw out carbohydrates. So th I think what I'm doing now uh, is now, now I'm doing dry fasting. So I have a four hour hydration and eating window, which is usually between four and eight o'clock. I try and make it between four and eight o'clock. It's going to be earlier today because here we are. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, but outside of that window, no liquids, no food. Uh, I feel like I've been fired out of a can and I feel great. Now, obviously, it's a big change. You, your body needs to find a new homeostasis, a new way to hydrate because you're using metabolic water. So what happens is your body starts pulling uh, moisture out of fat cells, which destroys them. Mm. So, uh, which is normal weight loss, just shrinks fat cells, it doesn't destroy them. So this actually destroys fat cells with some sort of permanence. And when it pulls that water, you notice, like, you don't cramp. Like, I, I won't drink any water for 20 hours. Go do my workout, zero cramps, nothing. Don't have any dry mouth, nothing at all. And that just means my body is pulling metabolic water. And I'll do this until 
I get to a point where I can tell my body's so low in body fat that it's fighting me. Like I don't have any other fuel storage. But I, last I checked, I had 7% body fat. So now I'm using the military test uh, with the equations. So um, now that, so that lines up kind of with, I think it lines up better with caliper tests, which might be 4% off from a DEXA scan. All right. So 7% might maybe, well, four, four with higher body fat, because we have a lot more data points on higher body fat, because most people are fat. Uh, so when it comes to leaner people, it's really hard to say, but generally it's four plus. Do you, so, get, do you, do you, do you get like dehydrated or anything? Like, on a, like it's pretty hot today, and like if you're moving around, do you ever sort of think, shit, I'm, I'm just, dehydrated at all or not. You, your body keeps you keeps you in the right spot really? the metabolic water works oh. and I don't have a dry mouth or anything like that whole workout like I drank some Fortigen which I made right when I got here and mm. went and grabbed you guys at the bar mm. um, so yeah and that's, so, that's so it, it just balances itself out then over yeah. time does it yeah, yeah. Um, I, now she doesn't love the dry fast and you've tried it Oh, yeah, you're not. You're just not yeah. used to it. I, I definitely, yeah. I can't. I have to drink some liquids during the day. But one meal a day wasn't super hard for me. I, I think the only thing that scared me about it was losing my gains that I had gained before um, doing the dry fast. I was super scared if I wasn't eating this many calories. Oh, am I gonna lose? You know, the gains. Lose muscle, you're great. Mm -hmm. And. Um, that didn't happen at all. If anything, I look more defined than I've ever looked. So. so I have a section in the book, um, and I put a lot of detail in this, about an anabolic rebound to a fasted period. And this is why, so there's so many arguments about like, fasting is just caloric restriction. No, it's not. And uh, whoever says that is only selectively looking at research. Um, now, I'm not ignoring the caloric restriction research at all. But I'm saying fasting does have some properties that are a little different. For example, they took two groups of people. Neither group of people worked out. They ate exactly the same amount of calories. One group of people uh, was like doing, I think every other day did one meal a day. And the other group just had caloric restriction. But they're both consuming the same amount of calories. Just one, every other day, one group had all their calories at once. Now, over, I believe it was six months, the group that did intermittent fasting put on two kilos of muscle. They didn't exercise at all. Why? There's, and, and it was very obvious in one group, and there's 20 people in each group, so it wasn't like just one guy put on like a whole bunch of muscle and maybe he was like lifting weights secretly. Like, no. Like, and the, and the researchers put, they, they didn't even put it in the, in the summary or the abstract, they put it in the discussion section because it was sort of like, well, the percentage of body fat went down with the fasted group uh, more, much more drastically than the calorically restricted group, but also contributing to their better percentage of body fat was the fact that they gained two, it was actually 2.2 kilos of muscle. Wow. And of so course, well. they were just sort of like, what do you know? Well, they're specialists in weight loss. Muscle gain is not really their thing. So they just thought it was an interesting thing to note. But the reason I found this was I went to my co-author, Henry, and I said, I, I gotta, I, I'm noticing something. That the more I fast, the bigger I'm getting. And it's fat. It's like fast. I'm ga gaining muscle faster. I'm not doing anything different. My diet's not different. I don't take any supplements. I take nothing. Uh, I have mentioned that I'm on TRT. Like everyone has a little type of fit about that. Uh, TRT stands for replacement, so it means I have a natural level of testosterone, which is also like doing nothing. Uh, you know, it gets me back to where I'm supposed to be because I had a rugby accident, so that, that's where I have a suppressed uh, testosterone level. So um, no changes at all, and I, I'm just putting on muscle so fast. And this is a couple months before the book came out. And I said, I, I, I want you to look for something. And this is not how scientific research normally goes. It never goes smoothly. But I said, I want you to find some references. And I, got, uh, and I want you to read discussion sections, not abstracts. 
So find every human trial on fasting and find out if there's any strange occurrence of muscle mass gain. And he's like, do you know how specific that is? I am never going to find that. I will spend the next 10 hours of my life looking for this and there will be nothing. And then I said, are you sure? And he said, no. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, all right, just humor me. Just put five hours into it and see what you can find. Half an hour later, he calls and he's like, dude, was this a trick? Because I found exactly what you described. <laughs> and I said, no, tell me about it. And you know, he read it to me and then he, he sent me some screenshots of the text. And I was like, I knew it. I'm like, I absolutely knew it. So this one meal a day, I, I believe you take advantage of the of this anabolic accelerated period. So your body's kind of starving and then you introduce nutrients and it uses the nutrients better and applies more muscle protein synthesis. Now, mm. maybe this is because as animals, the body may be sensing we're not fast enough or strong enough to catch our prey. Mm -hmm. So it's got to give us a little bit more. Right, got to give us a little more ability. So, uh, but if you think two kilos of muscle, that's a that's lot. A lot. Yeah. And these people didn't exercise at all. And neither did the control group. And of course, they gained no lean mass. Mm. None at all. Uh, they lost a tiny bit. Not a lot, though. How do, how do you find that, like, in terms of creating, like, a, a lifestyle around that? Do you, you know, with everything that's going on and going out and traveling, do, 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 you, still, do, you, do you feel that's a com comfortable to fit into your, to, to a lifestyle? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think the X3 in general is great for my lifestyle because I, I work all day and then I don't have time to go to the gym and... Well, also, we travel. And, we always bring the X3 right. with us. Yeah. I want to have an, a normal life where I can still go out and do things and have fun and not make my whole life revolve around the gym. Mm. And, you know... What's, but for the nutrition part, yeah. though, like, does that as well, like, if you go out for dinner and things and... Oh, yeah. And, I, I've or I always like steaks anyway, so yeah. it's easy for me. Yeah, I could see it difficult for someone who doesn't like meat, but <laughs> but for me it's fine. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't go out with somebody like that. <laughs> Strange. And you don't eat in the day. I don't, you I don't, don't sign up for uh, like... partners with malnutrition problems. No, I mean, and you, you don't like wake up in the morning. And I, I suppose for me, it's like I I do get seem to get hungry in the day. Like maybe I'm sure I could do it because I've, I've fasted before, but it seems like um, I don't know. It seems like um, quite you've got to be quite disciplined, I suppose, just to right. to make it work. But I think one one thing that works is we just don't stop during the day. Yeah. So uh, you know, if you stop for lunch, yeah, you eat lunch. Yeah. If you don't stop, you don't eat lunch. No. Right. So the same thing for breakfast is like I kind of wake up, splash some water in my face, and I'm I'm ready to go. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to give it a try then. I've tried the X bar. I'll have to, I'll have to try the Fortagen and the uh, one meal a day. I don't know about the dry fasting. Yeah. Maybe I'll try that for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if Fortagen works for you, you trust me even more, then we can talk about dry fasting. But the, the people that are getting the incredible results are it's dry fasting, one meal a day, Fortagen, and X3. And, uh, you know, and also, People should really trust me when I talk about the dry fasting. I have zero to gain no. by getting people to dry fast. I mean, I'm selling people a product when I talk about Fortigen. I'm selling people a product when I get them excited about X3. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, even, even the NFL guys know I have something to gain when I work with them. It's like, yeah, like I'm leveraging the fact that I'm working with you. They know that and they, they get it. They, they, they appreciate it too, mm. uh, especially because they give them a lot of attention. Um, and it's funny, they all think that their case is really complicated, like they're covered with injuries and they, you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to squeeze one or two more seasons out. And then, you know, I don't really say anything, but after I build some rapport with them, I'm like, you do realize you're like everybody else. You're just in the NFL. You're also a lot stronger, but yeah, everybody's got little things, you know, they're, their kid jumped into their arms when they weren't ready for their kid to do so, and they hammered the disc in their back. It happens. Mm. Yeah. So. And you, and you, you also have some beer every now and again, don't don't you think that dehydrates you and makes when you're not 
drink it when you're not uh, yeah drinking fluids does that so impact it? when I rehydrate I like beer are we gonna get in trouble for talking about alcohol on, on social media? <laughs> Don't put that in the clip, because uh, if it goes on Instagram, you don't want to promote alcohol. Yeah, I think beer is kind of the ultimate rehydration. Now, it hydrates you and then dehydrates you, yeah. which sets you up for the next day okay. and gets you using metabolic water faster. So I like oh. the beer while I'm rehydrating, because there's a little bit of sodium, a little bit of carbohydrate. Now, I only drink light beers, so a little bit of carbohydrate, so maybe you like two, if it's a Michelob Ultra, it's two. If it's a Stella, it's like six. Uh, Stella tastes better, but, um, you know, and there's a little sodium in there too. So you retain water for a period of time and then you're, because of the alcohol, you're ready to get rid of it. Yeah. So it's, it gives you the hydration benefit and clean cells out and you know, it's mostly water anyway. Now I also drink uh, probably a liter and a half of just water. Yeah. So I probably drink more water than most people do in a day, yeah. just in that four hour period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's cause I'm slugging down the Fortigen and right. wh whatever else. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, it is, yeah. It, it, it comes out so that the results are just amazing. Good. Yeah. yeah. All right, well thanks guys. Thank you very much. Oh, appreciate it. And, uh, <laughs> had, a, had a good time yeah. today and yep. um, yeah, uh, good luck with the, uh, with the X spot. This is what I recommend people start with. Okay, so two leg squat, you grab underneath. Yeah. You come down, I like getting the weight on my thumb before I place it on my shoulders. Or front squat. Right, the front squat is so much better. All right, the back squat. Okay. I mean, there are other ways of doing the squat. Eventually, you shift to one leg forward, one leg back. Oh, okay. You do the same thing. We're humans, we run on one leg at a time. Yeah. We should train on one leg at a time. Also, everybody think about this. If all the resources of your body are going into one quadricep and one glute, aren't you gonna get a lot more growth than if you're splitting that resource in half? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Try not to lock out at the top. Yeah, I, I knew that would get you. <laughs>